What is it, Gabriel? Horsey! 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 Just to let you know, there's blankets on the carriage because I know sometimes oh, it can get so windy. Nice. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Dad, I want you on your lap. Okay, you gotta just go over the Most important person on this ride is Kevin, and Kevin is your voice of history. So, oh, okay. in the next couple of hours, he's going to tell you all about what went on out here and everything. But this is your tour, so make it your tour. Ask him questions, you know. It, it will be going, we'll be hitting speeds about two mile an hour. So you'll have <laughs> plenty of time, you know, to ask him questions as we go along. And that's kind of the neat thing about this ride. You can interact with the guide. Yeah. And we're going at the speed of history, so you can kind of see how the terrain and everything changes, which you don't see in a car. But the town naturally expanded a little bit of time before preservation kicked in full force. So everywhere we got on open fields, modern development, three times bigger today than the town was when the battle began. But from here forward, these are probably most of a picture in our mind. When we were thinking, or you know, when we typed in Gettysburg into Google and some images popped up, you know, fences and fields and trees and rocks and hills and that sort of stuff. And the way the National Park Service preserves this battlefield today, it's amazing what they do. It means everywhere you look in the distance here, where you see a fence line, is the exact same type of fence in the exact same location as a soldier saw it. Where you see fields, or the same place as soldiers saw fields with farmers growing things. Where you see tree-covered ridges, same locations where they saw tree-covered ridges. So that means when we're right here, for example, this is an original road that was in place before the battle. It was a dirt road at the time. A soldier right here, looking that direction, sees exactly the same thing that you saw, with the exception, obviously, of the monuments. That would not have been there. So north, east, south, west is what's around us. The southern army is going to come into this battle from the north. The northern army is going to come in from the south. Oh, okay. So ultimately, northerners, when they come in, some of them are going to be on this very road. That one, they're going to march right through us into the town that way. Southerners wrapping around there. So it's the exact opposite okay. of what we may think at first hand. And when the battle is going to develop in earnestness, that we'll talk about in some more detail, the southern army is going to be in these trees over here. That's called Seminary Ridge. The northern army of the United States on that highest point in the ground. And an easy thing you can remember, if you remember nothing else from our two hours, remember this one detail is gonna unlock the battlefield for you, the monuments. They are placed by the veterans in the years later and the monuments were required to be placed on the battle lines where the fighting began. So what that means for you, even if you don't know, you know, who's that person, what's that unit, where are they from, even if you don't care about that level of detail, you can look right here on this ridge line and you just play connect the dots with the monuments. And you can trace where the battle lines are in the distance and then you can see where they go further away from us. As you just follow the strings of monuments, they're not just picked randomly in prominent locations. They were required to be put where the soldiers actually were. So you see a northern battle line here and then in the distance you see some Confederate monuments, some smaller ones. Just connect the dots there. So it's really useful even as you're going around on your own. Say you climb up on a little round top lane or something, you're looking out in the distance. What was happening out here? If you can find monuments, you can trace kind of that blue line and the gray line. That's kind of awesome. how they were moving and pivoting. It's one of those critical things. Again, if you remember nothing else and all the detail we're going to talk about, remember that one. Because it lets you piece things together on your own. Are we going to pass the round top? We'll be able to see it, but we won't actually go up on top of it. Or you drive to Yes, you can. There's a parking lot on top of it. Okay, great. So you can drive to it on it. So. Yeah, you can see Little Round Top from here. Number two. I have no idea. battles that are going to happen there. Yep. They don't have them quite on the scale of what we're going to have. I mean, almost nothing is on the scale of Gettysburg, per se. But they're going to have one just outside of Kansas City, Westport, Missouri. It's just called the Gettysburg of the West is how that's going to be described. Missouri is going to be split. So it's going to have ferocious guerrilla warfare going on during it, north and south. So right along the Missouri River, going through the center of the state, that's called Little Dixie. That's a heavily southern area of Missouri. You go to the big city, St. Louis, Kansas City, very strongly northerner, northern Missouri, north, and then when you get down to southern Missouri, it's more into the Confederacy leanings. 
Okay. So you're split in the towns there. To it. You shove it all the way to the back, one at a time. Fire about three shots a minute, about 300, maybe 350 yards you can fire at most. And they stood in long lines. So it'd be like kind of us facing each other, you know, one line here, one line there, going at each other shoulder to shoulder is the way that they're going to be working. Was this really a pick fence? Absolutely it was, yes. So the fences not only in the same location, but are the same type of fences as what was here. Fences not built by the military, but built by the farmers for whatever the purpose was for that field. Whether it sometimes keep something out, other times keep something in. Property lines for all the fences around us. Just reminds us of the people who put this stuff up. And who are going to lose on top of everything else they're going to lose. They're going to lose their fences too. When they all get torn down and shredded by the army. Vant Grant is in Mississippi right now. Vicksburg, Mississippi is where he is on the Mississippi River there. He's choking it down and what nobody knows, the day after this battle is over, Vicksburg, Mississippi is going to surrender to Ulysses Grant. And so you'll have these two giant hammer blows on the south. A defeat at Gettysburg. Sorry, spoiler alert if you didn't know the south loses here. A defeat at Gettysburg and then a surrender of that river city of Vicksburg which opens up the Mississippi River and cuts the south in two. Now Missouri, Arkansas, all those other places, they're on one side of the river. Union gunboats, the Navy is in the middle and splits the south in half. These are the two commanders at this battle. So again, George Meade, the Union side. Robert E. Lee, the southern side over there. Totally different guys though. Robert E. Lee, even in 1863 when the battles fought here, soldiers under his command have already put him into a little bit of a mythic status. Many of them already believe he's borderline invincible. He's not, but what matters is some of them believe that he is. And so if Lee gives you an order, if you're a southerner, if you're a soldier in his command, you believe it's very well thought out and there is a very high chance of success, no matter what the battlefield shows otherwise on paper. For George Meade, it's very different than that, though. He's a very experienced commander, but he's brand new to command of the entire army. He's been in command of the entire army for three days when this battle happens. He's been a soldier for years, but this time last week, he was in charge of 10,000 guys. Now he's in charge of over 90,000 guys, and nobody knows if they're able to handle that or not. This is his first exposure into that, and he's going to prove by the end of these three days to be more than up for the task when it comes down to it. But when they're coming on the battlefield, they don't know that at first. Lee is the one who's going to start things here very quickly. If you look in the distance over there, you may be able to see a kind of a mountain range. Do they go all the way down to Virginia? Are they the Blue Ridge? That's yeah. the an extension of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Yep, South Mountain Pass of the Blue Ridge is what we're looking at. So those mountains in Virginia, that is the mountain range that Robert E. Lee is going to begin his invasion behind. Um, Sneaky. He's using it intentionally. Use geography to protect you. So he marches behind those mountains, way ahead of us in Virginia, with 72,000 soldiers, knowing that as he marches north, there will be a physical mountain range between him and an enemy army. It's going to protect him as he moves up here into Pennsylvania. He's making this invasion to end the war, hopefully. Because he knows, after two years of war, it's not enough to just win a bunch of battles. Numbers and other things are not on his side. 31 million people are in the country when the war starts. When the split between North and South happens, out of those 31 million, 22 million are in the North, 9 million are in the South. And out of those 9 million in the South, 3.5 million of them are enslaved. They absolutely are not fighting for the South. We cannot forget the centrality of slavery to everything connected to this war. So it means if you're just looking at cold numbers, you have 22 million Northerners, versus five and a half million white Southerners. Southerners are using only their white men to fight. That is not the case with the Northern Army now. They are enlisting hundreds of thousands of now free and formerly enslaved black soldiers. They are enlisting thousands of people of Hispanic descent, of Asian descent. Hundreds of Hawaiians are now joining. That's before it's a part of the United States of America formally. The Union is bringing a very diverse army growing from 1863 forward. So Lee knows with these numbers, the war needs to end now. The longer it goes, we're going to run out of people at a certain point. I don't know how they got them going to win. <laughs> I mean, they do pretty well, they all things well. considered, with everything that was stacked up against them. And Lee's structure, the way that Robert E. Lee wins, it's very different than the way, say, Abraham Lincoln wins. Abraham Lincoln wins by bringing the South to its knees. 
breaking its will and destroying its armies and forcing them to surrender completely, totally, and unconditionally. Robert E. Lee wins by getting the North, Northern people to just say, you know, it's just not worth it anymore. If they want to go, let them go. It's too expensive. We're tired of the casualty reports. So Lee doesn't need to destroy DC. He doesn't need to slaughter the armies. He just needs to get people like you and me, Northern civilians perhaps, to say, you know, let them go. Have their little experiment. They'll fail in a generation. They'll come back. We just got to, it's the American Revolution idea. Think about it, when America was birthed out of this war, it wasn't because we destroyed Great Britain. I mean, it still exists today. It just got to a point where they said, you know what? It just costs too much. There's too much life on the line. It's too far away. If they want to go, just let them go. Eventually, they'll come back to the king. Let them flounder for a little bit. That's Lee's game plan. So to end that, he doesn't have to annihilate armies. He just has to get you and me to tell our elected officials the war needs to end. And what better way to do that than to bring the war out of the south and into the north with a decisive blow. So for the people to not support it, Robert E. Lee knows you bring the war out of the south, you let the south recover, and you feed and equip and supply your army on farms like this. All throughout the north, terrorizing the civilians, adding that political pressure on top of it, and achieving a battlefield victory is the icing on the cake to all of that. It's the ultimate message to the entire international community. Not only can this president of the United States not put us down in our own states, he can't even protect his own loyal states anymore. Somebody's gotta come in and force him to come to the negotiating table internationally and in this thing. So Lee is rolling the dice here. It's a gamble, no question about it. But he feels it has a good chance of success if everything goes well. Day of fighting by the time that we are here. And to help all of you figure out, these are two maps, both of the second day, July 2nd, 1863, if the wind won't stop blowing from you. We got onto the carriage about right there. And then we rode all the way down the Emmitsburg Road and we turned at the Wheatfield Road. The Wheatfield Road is that one right there. It's one of these original roads. That one was here in 1863. So that intersection, Wheatfield, Millerstown Road, Emmitsburg Road was all here intact. So right now we're standing roughly right here, just beneath the peach orchard. Robert E. Lee's battle plan for July 2nd, again, he's the Confederate commander over there in the woods. His plan is to take 14,000 of his men under the command of a man named James Longstreet. Longstreet's his number one dude. And Robert E. Lee calls Longstreet, my old war horse, is the phrase he's gonna use. He trusts this guy like nobody else. He tells him, take 14,000 soldiers and march south, which is that way, through the trees. The goal then, as they're marching south on the map, it's this way, is they're gonna march far enough there, that way, that they can swing around these fields in a gigantic U-turn. You see what's going on in the map here? Yeah. Gonna swing around the side and destroy the Union Army by striking its side. So for our orientation, march several miles that direction, move out around these fields in a giant hook around us, and then destroy the Union Army back there. That's what's so important about getting out on the battlefield, because we have, especially looking at maps like this, we all see things from above. We yeah, know where like, everybody is. Yeah, like, at the okay, end of the day. how come they, they didn't don't. see them? Yes, <laughs> and even if somebody is able to see them, there is zero real-time communication in the Civil War. Yeah, right. <laughs> so even if you happen to be here and be like, hey, something fishy is going on over there, how fast can you get a message way back yeah. there? Oh, yeah. It's, the message can't go any faster than a horse can run if you have a horse and if you're able to go at that moment and if you find who you're looking for at yeah. that moment in time. Yeah. So this map is the battle plan based on what Confederate scouts have told Robert E. Lee. This map is what the battlefield actually looks like on July 2nd. What Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet don't know, their scouts got the report wrong about the battlefield. We don't know exactly about? what happened here. Yeah. There's entire books trying that are written yeah. trying to understand exactly oh, what okay. happened here. The scout didn't do it wrong on purpose. He's not a spy oh, or anything yeah. like that. Just something genuinely happened yeah. here and either a miscommunication or right. more likely the battlefield changed from the time the scout did their report in the early morning until the attack began as we're pushing into the late afternoon. Okay. This map is what the battlefield really is and you see some key differences yeah. between these two. Most notable among them, although there's you know slight differences in where the lines are, we've got these soldiers back here that Robert E. Lee and the Confederates know nothing about. We've got about 20,000 Union reinforcements advancing onto the field, which is some of what these units are representing. And for our point of view, that's gonna be behind the round tops. They're coming on some of those two roads back there, moving into this area of the battlefield, most likely. We've also got these guys. The Confederates know nothing about these guys. And if you catch it, this is exactly where we are. 
There are 11,000 United States soldiers right here where we are standing. And, and, the blue. Conf so, and they're blue, yes. <laughs> Confederates so, so don't know So our soldier could be standing right where I am. Absolutely. Cool. Very likely here. So they've got a battle line that's shaped like a gigantic L. And the L bends here in the peach orchard. So for our orientation, that means the line was all along the road that we were riding on. You probably caught the monuments at several occasions. I mean, if you remember what I said earlier about monuments on yeah. battle lines, you already knew there was something I wasn't saying as we're going past all these monuments. They follow the road here to the peach orchard. Then it turns at a 90 degree angle. And now it's facing that way. And it goes down across this valley through those trees towards the round tops. That's that L-shaped battle line. So it's like kind of like the angle, I guess like that, like the angle of the book. Some of us are fighting that way, some of us are fighting that way. 11,000 United States soldiers the Confederates don't know about, but they're marching right into. But what makes our story really, really weird, these 11,000 guys don't know the Confederates are coming. It's not like they cracked the code and got in their way or are gonna surprise them or anything. It's a happy accident, or depending on your perspective, I guess an unhappy accident, when 14,000 Confederates are surprised by 11,000 United States soldiers and 11,000 United States soldiers are surprised by 14,000 Confederates, but this shapes the fighting on July 2nd. Who's gonna win this titanic struggle that centers right here in the Peach Orchard? This is the eye of the hurricane. You can see, for example, the line facing this way, they got great views in that direction. If you're stretching down on this part of the line. Yeah. But if you're on that part of the line too, well, can you see that way? Yeah. Where the yeah. attack can also come from. That's the problem when you're in a line like this, where it bends at an angle. How many directions can you shoot at one time? Yeah. How many directions can you be shot at from one time? And so if you're on this part of the line maybe, and somebody, a Confederate over there shoots and misses, it goes a little far, it can still get you over here. Hmm. Vice versa, Confederates firing that way miss, they can still get that other part of the line. This is very vulnerable, this is very dangerous, and just a flash forward to the end of our story here, the, Union, the United States battle line here is going to be annihilated in this ground. They are gonna break, they are gonna be destroyed, and they are gonna be running for their life by nightfall. Confederates are gonna swarm through this whole area. So not only is unquestionably someone standing where we are at some point in time, very high likelihood somebody is shot where we are, at least one somebody at various times. Union line ferociously defending itself that direction. And then they break and Confederates swarming through here, but they don't stop here. They roll their artillery up here after them and they continue chasing. And by nightfall, again, we'll fill in all the details as we ride further along and see more of those scenes. Everything from here to the base of the big white domed monument over there, the Pennsylvania Memorial, that is all taken by the Confederate Army in three hours of fighting on July 2nd of 1863. This is a massive disaster for the United States forces out here. This whole 11,000 man battle line is driven back in that full state of retreat on July 2nd. It's cataclysmically bad, but the breakthrough starts right here. But recognize when a breakthrough starts, not everybody can see that there's been a breakthrough. Because we could see it here from this vantage point, but all those people going further down there, and especially the people into the trees and beyond, they have no idea what's going on up here. You don't know until that breakthrough starts firing at you from either the side of you or behind you, which is exactly what is going to happen. These are the first people to be broken, but that doesn't mean even that gun crew right there, 15th New York Battery there, they don't know the breakthrough's happened until Confederates come right over this little hill, having broken through right here, pause roughly where we are, level their guns and fire a volley straight into them. These poor guys, they had no way to be able to see it coming. The battlefield's so chaotic and confusing. You're focused on your job. You can't be worrying about what's happening Around a couple here. dozen yards off. You have to trust other people are also doing their jobs. And collectively, if you're all doing your jobs, we're gonna do well at the end. But the end, there's no communication. And there's no <laughs> ability to communicate. So I'm sure, you know, people say, what if they had, you know, machine guns, things like that. I think the single most important thing that would have changed the course of the Civil War or any battle any number of times is just one set of walkie talkies just a pair of them. The ability, say, a moment in time for somebody, a colonel in the peach orchard to grab his walkie-talkie and talk to army headquarters and say, our line is breaking in the peach orchard, to be able to get that yeah. message out there the moment it is happening. You could get everybody else starting to stream out of here before the line has broken. And the only way you get your message otherwise, there are thousands of our men running, screaming, terrified, bleeding, and limping past us. And now they're being chased at and shot the entire time. Real-time communication is everything about this battle. And they just, you know, the power of a text. So two different types of cannons. So there's the black ones. That, the black ones are rifle. They could shoot easily two miles. The green one's not rifle, so it's more like a shot put. 
shoving something out, that could go about a mile. You could push it beyond that, but you lose tremendous accuracy after that point. These cannons, the original ones that was in the battle? Or? So these cannons that we're seeing are from the Civil War, okay. but are not necessarily the ones used in this battle. Infantry protects artillery at close range, and artillery protects the infantry at long range because they can fire over their head. One okay, without so the other the is vulnerable. Are in front of the cannons. Right. Okay. So the cannons can fire over them, and the infantry in front can make sure that no in, no enemy infantry is close enough to shoot directly at the artillery soldier. The problem, remember that that was a gap in the line, so the guns there are moved in kind of haphazardly out of an emergency. There's no infantry with them because there wasn't any available. So those guns are on their own. Confederates see this, and they launch a frontal assault on the line of cannons. Because the realization is, they can destroy us as long as we're far away. But if we get up close to them, we can just slaughter them. That, combined with a breakthrough in the Peach Orchard, is the scene for disaster. Because that gun line are the first ones to discover the breakthrough when they're getting shot at from the side. And now they're getting charged at from the front. And this is day two. This is all day two here. It is. So yeah, you know that tree has bullets and shrapnel and all sorts of things still embedded inside it. You've got a giant hole that's in the brick wall. You look between the diamonds there, you can oh, see, see where it. that was yeah. pierced yeah. by a Confederate artillery shell, July 2nd of 1863. It's authentic battle damage wow. on your other side. This is an image that's painted by an artist, obviously someone who wasn't here, about the last stand of the 9th Massachusetts, which is happening just right here around this witness tree. You can see the barn there, hey, on the hands there. Yeah, yeah. See some various other buildings. See all their positions, their guns are now in 180 degrees. They put them in a half moon because they gotta fire that way, they gotta fire that way, they gotta fire that way, cover all of it. They've taken all the ammunition out of their cases, which they put it in to keep it safe. They just throw it on the ground next to the gun to save time, so you gotta fire these guns as fast as you possibly can. But that means you have hundreds of pounds of gunpowder now laying all around you, which is dangerous in its own right. Guns can't recoil, they're slamming into each other and Confederates are gunning them down at every stretch of the way. The 9th Massachusetts Battery, to my knowledge, is the only unit on this entire battlefield in their monument who doesn't just list their casualties, they list their horses' casualties. We mentioned it briefly earlier that you take out horses if you want to strand artillery. They brought 88 horses with them out into this battlefield on the morning of July 2nd by nightfall, the handful of survivors who make it out of here, they only have eight horses still with them. Mm. The family who lives here at the time says when they came out, there were over 100 dead horses lying in the yard of this barn. There's pictures of it, and I'll give a caution advisor to make kind of decisions as you want to as we go. Two images that I'll pass around, one on this side and one on the back side. When you see on the back side, there's a barn in it, which is that barn. This one, there's a house in it, which is the house up ahead of us, and I'll pass that around for those of you who want to look at that. It's kind of a brief little glimpse of like a high-pitched whale. He does admit, this isn't included in the newsreel footage, but he says beforehand, you can only do the rebel yell one when you're running. And number two, he says, you can't do it when you have a belly full of food, which he would have by that point. He says, you're used to starving. And number three, he says, it's really hard to do when you don't have your original teeth. So he's saying, I'm giving you a little kind of yip for it, okay, but he's saying this is nothing like it. Union soldiers who heard it overwhelmingly are going to acknowledge in their writings, no one ever heard the rebel yell who wasn't scared when they heard it. While nobody can 100% authentically create it, I think the group that has done the absolute best in doing so is called the Liberty Rifles. They're a reenacting group. They're the one that Gettysburg National Military Park uses anytime you see reenactors on the actual battlefield. It's them. You know, we can argue this, but when it comes to Civil War reenactors in terms of authenticity, I think they are the absolute tip of the sword. Do they ever have that here? Like they, they don't do they don't do combat reenactments, but they do like living. They'll set up encampments, or they'll be like marching and maneuvering through. And that's a part of what I want to play for. They do both sides, but they did, they recreated the attack on Little Round Top at a moment just in sound, so they're not firing their guns or anything. And I don't think in our modern generation we'll ever hear anything that maybe more closely approximates the rebel yell than, than kind of this moment here. But hopefully we can all hear as it goes. Just imagine that all around us. 
thousands of them and gunfire scattered in and what that does psychologically. Winfield Scott Hancock, he's the number two guy in the entire Union Army, said to be the third best cusser in the whole Union Army too at the same time. He comes galloping down as fast as he can because he hears the rebel yell, he sees him advancing here, knows somebody's got to do something immediately or we're about to be annihilated. He rides up to the Minnesota and says, my God, is this all the men we have? What unit is this? Says, I'm Colonel William Colville, 1st Minnesota Infantry. Colonel Colville, do you see their flags? And he's pointing into the trees. Remember, the flags are still visible there. Yes, sir, I see their flags. Colonel Colville, advance your Minnesotans and bring me their flags when you are done with them. 262 guys from Minnesota with loaded muskets rise up, fix bayonets, and begin charging across this field in five times their own number. You see their monument still to this day. He is bayonet charging that field for all of eternity. They climb over the one fence that you see. We'll go to the edge of the ravine there. When they arrive at the edge, the way there was a depression, the Confederates couldn't see them coming, so there's an element of surprise here. They were at a run, they slam on a halt, and at this moment, accounts tell us they are four paces away from each other. That's like front to the back of the carriage here. They level their guns, fire 262 guns at once into the face of the Confederates. Now bayonets forward. They stab, they bite, they claw, they kick, they punch their way through the rest of them until they do the impossible. They drive back five times their own number. Wow. But the price of doing that on this field by nightfall, July 2nd of 1863, for all intents and purposes, the first Minnesota no longer exists. It suffered 83% casualties in about five minutes of heavy fighting here. Done. So the Union line will hold. General Hancock knows I need time to get reinforcements here, and I only have 262 guys to buy that time, so I need all of your lives in exchange for five minutes so the rest of the army can get in a position to repel anything that's left. It's crazy, but it works. It's a fair question. It's saying that here that we are fundamentally on a battlefield. Even if it is removed in that regard, more American casualties, the bloodiest battle in American history that we are on. But this battlefield as well, even if we remove ourselves from the combat phases, think about how many tens of thousands of these young men who fought here are going to have nightmares about everything you're seeing for the rest of their life. When they see these fences are triggering, again, this generation does not know PTSD or things like that. It is absolutely happening. They just have no understanding of that language. And so for so many of them, that is an element of why licensed battlefield guides exist. We were created by the veterans themselves in 1915 because they wanted it to be very clear that this was not just be a place for recreation and vacation and fun. They wanted to make sure, number one, the story was told correctly, and number two, that it was told with the weight that they felt their experience required of it. And having said that, I do fully acknowledge it is depressing, a lot of what we're talking about. We understand things that we have an awareness. They have absolutely no generational awareness even that anything that says, you go off to war, you saw awful things, it's over. You're supposed to go back to regular life. Then as now, survivors here will still take their lives in dozens every day moving forward. as the split is coming, one politician is going to say, in this coming great civil war we speak of on the floor of Congress, he says, I will be able to soak up all of the blood our nation shall spill with my one handkerchief. And pulls it out. But again, nobody believes this is going to be more than maybe, you know, one little fancy battle that'll happen. It'll look all fun and smoke. We'll go have our picnics and then it's over. We know in hindsight, we are still, even after this battle, nowhere near the end of the bloodletting. There's more Americans who die in the Civil War than every other war in our nation's history combined still to the present day. I mean, they have no idea what's coming that day. I think still in 1863, they can't even imagine what 1864 is going to bring. On July 3rd, Robert E. Lee believes victory is still in his grasp. He knows how close it was July 2nd that they destroyed a major part of the Union Army, pushing them all the way back from where we were in the Peach Orchard. And he knows the only reason they didn't split the army in two was because of groups who did amazing things, like the 9th Massachusetts, like the 1st Minnesota. And in the Civil War, they would be able to respect that on the other side, the heroism on display, even if they their plan. So Lee can tip his cap to those boys from Minnesota and from Massachusetts. Northern generals could do the same thing for heroism on the Confederate side. But he knows if it wasn't for those tremendously courageous people, we would have won the day on July 2nd. So victory is still ours. So July 3rd, his thinking is, they've reinforced their sides all night long because they think I'm going to re-attack there. 
So I'm gonna attack them now where they intentionally weaken, which is the middle. They think I'm attacking the side, so it's stronger there. They weaken to the middle, so I'm gonna strike them in the middle, which is right here where we are. We got about five or 10 minutes. So okay, we get out. Yep. so we can head out here. So at this distance, again, you could physically see General Lee even from the Union battle line here. You wouldn't necessarily know who you're seeing when you looked across it, but you'd see an officer in that location. Robert E. Lee's plan, gamble everything on a direct assault right here because he believes George Meade has weakened his center to outthink us and reinforce the side. So we're just gonna do the opposite of what he expects us to do. So in the morning, if you looked out in that field, if you're one of these Union defenders who would be along the stone wall up ahead of us, they're gonna be along the secondary stone wall back there. The Philadelphia Brigade will be right here where you're standing in this modern road. We look out there and we're gonna see that Lee has been busy during the dark. And now as the morning hours are coming up, there are 150 artillery guns in that field. They are all pointing right here. It's our first hint that Lee is planning something big on the center. And at 107 p.m. July 3rd of 1863, the entire field out there erupts in flame. These guns fire, 150 guns fire. And it's not like the movies show it where the ground explodes and send people flying through the air. They explode in the sky and they throw shrapnel down on you. So it's not people flying up, it's people getting violently thrown down on the ground as these things are hitting them coming from above. As soon as those guns fire, they immediately reload and start firing again. It's a long-term artillery barrage, not just a one volley and go. 80 Union cannons around us all return fire. We have 230 pieces of artillery firing back and forth on this field for 90 straight minutes. Wow. It's impossible to know for sure, but most historians believe that what we are hearing on this battlefield, on this spot, is the loudest sound in the history of this planet until that atomic bomb is dropped in 1945. It is so loud, we have witnesses here writing about this, we have witnesses on the Confederate line writing about this, describing it, saying they see their comrades bleeding from their ears. I was gonna say, I was Eardrums gonna, have ruptured. They no it is so, yeah, they don't have any ear protection or anything like that I going. I hear that the Confederates uh, were overshooting but they don't know they're overshooting. They don't, yeah, right. That's the catch, because when the guns fire, so much smoke is emerging out in the field, neither side can see the other after the first volley. So the only way you know whether your enemy is still there is what level of explosions are happening on your line. Back. That's why it goes on so long, because Confederates are receiving return fire from the Union, so they know they're still up here. After about an hour and a half, the Union decides, clearly Lee is gambling everything in the center. He's in enemy territory right now. He doesn't have his supply lines, all that stuff for extra ammunition. He's firing all this here. Whatever he's doing, he's gonna do this right after the artillery's done. So let's just make it happen and guarantee in doing that, we have ammunition for whatever he's doing. They slowly start stopping their guns from firing. They don't stop them all at once because that may be suspicious over there. One at a time, they stop these guns firing. So over the next couple minutes, Confederate studying are noticing we're slowly getting a lot less fire than we were about 10 minutes ago. So they make logical conclusions as best they can. Something's happening over here. One, they've run out of ammunition. Two, they're blowing up and they they're all. dying. We killed them all or they're running and the guns are getting, whatever is happening over here, we have a small window before they try to fix it. We gotta go now. Confederate guns cease firing and through the bank of smoke now come 13,000 Confederate infantry moving in a massive battle line with 42 blood red battle flags flying above them as they emerge out into that field. As soon as they come into our view, again, they'd be emerging out of a giant bank of smoke at first. Union guns over here make it very clear they're still here. They open up on them. 80 artillery pieces are firing into that field, cutting down Confederates in the distance as they're marching shoulder to shoulder. It's called Pickett's Charge, but they are walking across the field. They are not running because it's a mile long field. You gotta make it a mile just then to be able to fight hand like to hand. Thing. But it's got a decent chance of success in ways that we don't always guarantee because the day before, we didn't mention it, but Lee made it all the way across this field with only 1,200 guys on the late in the day on July 2nd and broke through the Union battle line right here. So his thinking is, if I add an extra zero to that number and give it artillery support, we can just destroy the entire line here. It's gonna go differently on the third than it did on the second though. The soldiers are getting to the fence out there. You see there's that road, which is the same one that we were on earlier. They have to climb over the fence, run across the road, which is dirt at the time, climb over the second fence. You can't march through that. So all their organization, the shoulder to shoulder breaks down. They're now a little bit more of a mob is a way to think of them. And at that occasion, two big things happen here where we are. One of them, the Union infantry, these are the foot soldiers with muskets. They haven't been doing anything yet. Or they've just been watching because it's been too far of range there. They're laying along the stone wall. They rise up, loaded guns, start opening fire. Load and fire as fast as you can from that point into the Confederates in the road. And artillery switches what it's firing. 
It had been firing this long range stuff that kind of explodes above you, throws shrapnel down. Now they're firing something called canister. Canister, basically a way to think of it, is a tin of coffee and fill it with little tiny iron marbles inside. It's like a shotgun on steroids. So when you fire it out, these balls are just designed to spread out and just take out whole chunks of people. So those are now being fired into the road right where that blue car is. The soldiers are now loading their muskets and pouring it into there. Confederates are dropping every moment that they are there. One description that's left behind tells us the Emmitsburg Road erupted into a mist of red at the moment they're firing it, and you know what that is, that mist of red. It's, it's going to a little bit later after that. Yeah. Into that continue fire, some Confederates continue running forward. Not all of them, many understandably are going to turn back at that level of fire, but it's clear from that point forward, if you're gonna continue this, there's no walking anymore. You gotta run, speed is the end of the game. You can't outshoot this, you just gotta get in among them. Hundreds of Confederates now running from the fence towards us here in the stone wall. They are gonna cross the stone wall between the monument with the upturned gun and the tree that's over there. That section of the stone wall, we hear that rebel yell now burst into this part of the battlefield and Confederates are swarming through here over that gun line held by Battery A of the 4th United States Artillery. There is desperate and deadly hand-to-hand -hand fighting here. The 69th Pennsylvania Regiment you see right there, they fall back from the stone wall at an angle. You've got another regiment that's gonna fall back, but they're not running for their life. They're just falling back temporarily to reform. So it's not a cataclysmic rout or defeat or anything happening here. And the, the infantry, that's exactly where you're standing from, Pens from Philadelphia. They didn't retreat at all. They're right here in this position. So a breakthrough is happening. Confederates are swarming right in front of us. Eventually, these soldiers are going to level their guns, fire a volley, charge. Those soldiers now, they're reformed, level their guns, fire, charge. Counterattack right in here. 300 Confederates made it all the way. That's not enough, though, if the Union Army doesn't retreat fully, and they don't retreat. Pickett's charge has failed. Every last one of the 300 Confederates who made it into the Union position, they are all killed, wounded, captured, or missing. And a, conf a Union soldiers afterwards put a monument telling us where the last Confederate made it before they were shot down. You see that monument right there with a the little Confederate flag still in front of it to this day. They came back, Union soldiers came back, placed that marker and said, that is where we shot down Brigadier General Lewis Armistead from Virginia, who they said was the furthest north a pair of Confederate boots made it on this battlefield. Wow. So as we head back to the carriage here, that's what's unfolding at this moment, is now after that, Lee is moving back out of the woods, over towards those mountains, and then back yeah, down south. And just imagine for these 1,700 people now when they come out of their house, there are 22,000 wounded soldiers lying all over the town, all around the field. 5,000 dead horses unburied here, 8,000 soldiers, means everybody has to do everything you can to take care of this. Regardless of who you are, whether you're Tilly Pierce or other, no matter what age you are, you're either in a hospital taking care of injured or dying people, or you're burying people or horses as fast as you possibly can. One of the people doing this, her name is Elizabeth Thorne. Elizabeth Thorne is married, but her husband is in the military, so he's gone. He wasn't at this battle, he's elsewhere at this time. She's got two kids, and she's six and a half months pregnant with her third child. In the third trimester of her pregnancy, Elizabeth Thorne is going to bury 104 soldiers herself before she goes into labor. That's what finally stops her. And that, that's just what you got to do if you want your home back. No, absolutely not. Because of that, they know they cannot give the proper burials that they would have wanted to give or that we would want to give. You gotta bury these people as fast as you possibly can. The level of loss and the amount of time in the July heat, it's really fast. And because of that, I mean, you know, not everything stays under the ground very long, to put it simply there. And that's what this battlefield looks like about a week later. The initial burials are, you know, happening all over the place. But for the first politicians coming, you know, boots are sticking up and arms and all this really grisly stuff out of these graves. The federal government now gets it starts getting its act together at the speed they're moving at. Raise money and pass legislation to rebury the dead at federal expense. And through the later summer into the early fall of 1863, graves that buried by the families are being removed and reinterred on that hill that you see surrounded by the stone fence up there. Today, we would know that as Cemetery Hill, that is the Soldiers National Cemetery that you were looking at, the second burial place for the soldiers who died on the battlefield. And that is the location four and a half months after the battle. November 19th of 1863, 
burials are still happening there that day. They paused them temporarily. A stack of coffins is visible off to the side because they're waiting. There's a VIP in town. Do I know who this is? Lincoln. Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, has come down. November 19th of 63, four and a half months after the battle, Abraham Lincoln is here in town now, specifically for that cemetery. They've invited him to give a few appropriate remarks. And that hill is where he's going to give the Gettysburg Address which is some of what we know as those most immortal words in American history, beginning with that first line that probably we all know, that four score and seven years ago. Right, where he gives those words, but remember, when Abraham Lincoln is giving these words, it is not a victory speech. The war is not over. It is actively still happening in other places. Even soldiers who fought at Gettysburg, the ones who survived, they're fighting other battles in other places. A lot could still go wrong. Lincoln gives us these words that resonate for all time, and a part of what he says, he says in this phrase, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And we are doing right now exactly what President Lincoln asked us to do, saying that 157 years later and beyond, we would never forget what they did here. This place still resonates here, and as we know, though the war goes on after this battle, it's not the first, it's not the last battle of the war, by the end of it all in 1865, for the first time in American history, the Commander-in-Chief has now joined his soldiers in the grave. When we lose our first president due to assassination, when Lincoln is gunned down the same week that Robert E. Lee will surrender in 1865. Meaning there is no rejoicing when the war is over. You celebrate an ending and then what feels like a few hours later, the president is shot and he is dead. And if you look at every other revolution in the history of this planet, its leaders in the aftermath are almost always executed as a warning for it. When Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses Grant, aside from things, I mean, we can say a lot of things about Robert E. Lee that are not flattering, but one thing I will say that is very flattering to him, when he agrees to surrender, he has no guarantee that that is not his fate. He has, if we just get down to the cold definition, he has just engaged in a failed attempt to overthrow the United States government. He was the chief leader of it. He's probably going to be executed. He's not, though. Lincoln says, let him up easy. He believes in peace. But when Grant is, or when Lee is going to surrender to Grant, he says, I now go to become General Grant's prisoner. He surrenders, and Grant basically says, you and all your soldiers, go home. Have you been there? I have, yes. An amazing, amazing spot there. So thank you all for being with us. I will hang around for questions as long as you want. Thank you. You can get around, check out those horses. Just go wide around before you approach them. Make sure you see their eyes before you approach them so you don't startle them. They've got blinders. Again, I'll hang around as long as you want. We've done this tour a lot, and you are fantastic. Oh, thank you. I never heard you say one thing I think was true. And that's not true. Test it all. Yeah. Well, the beauty is now that it's going on YouTube, you can fact check it multiple yeah. times. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you can read back and say, what did he really say? And you can type everything I say into Google as you go. It's